Every single racing driver in every single series, in simulators and in real life, has one technique in common. It's the most fundamental skill, but one that is often overlooked and under-refined. Get it right, you'll shave seconds off your lap times. Get it wrong, and you'll spin into the wall. There is no better way to learn this technique than on iRacing, where the physics of this are just perfect. And what is this, I hear you cry? This is trail braking. my simulator as you can see behind me and a Porsche Cup race at Donington Park. I'm going to show you how to execute this technique and teach you the theory and physics behind it. You'll see why it's so important and also some great racecraft. First off, the reason why I chose the Porsche Cup car is it has more power than grit, no ABS, no traction control, there is nowhere to hide with it. Throughout the video, you'll also be able to see all of my input traces here. What is trail braking? Simply, this is the action of braking and turning at the same time. Why do we want to do this? Well, unless you race a forklift, the steering wheels are at the front of the car and you want to give the front tires as much grip as possible before and during a turn. A car has a fixed mass, so low transfer to the front means low transfer away from the rear, just at the point where you're instigating a turning moment, and that is why you're at danger of spinning. This balancing act of inputs is so important, and that's why I suggest practicing on a sim where you get to really understand the actions and the theory behind it before you go out there and try and put as much weight on the front as possible and take as much weight away from the rear as possible. Because, fun fact, that's how you'd start a drift in a low-powered car. What's so hard, I hear you cry, just go 100% on the brakes and turn into the corner. Easy. Well, not really. And that's all down to the friction circle. And it isn't really a perfect circle, but for now, we'll simplify it and say it is. The friction circle is the fundamental philosophy behind all race driving, and it's going to get a bit technical, but I'll try and explain it simply. But if you understand all of the upcoming steps, then you will be a better racing driver. To begin, let's theorize that we have a maximum load of 1G across an axle in a car. This can be 1G longitudinally, which is braking and accelerating, or 1G laterally, which is cornering, but not both. Therefore, if you're braking in a straight line at a force of 1G, and then you add a lateral force by steering of 0.1G, you therefore must ease off the brakes to only have a braking force of 0.9G so that the sum of those vector forces equals your maximum one. Otherwise, beyond that limit, you lock up or slide or go beyond the bounds of what the car is capable of. If you're a physicist, you'll know that this is an approximation, but for now, let's kiss. <laughs> This is why one of the principles that every driver coach will teach you is imagine that there is a piece of string between your hands and your feet, meaning the more steering you apply, the less brake and vice versa. All of this also applies when accelerating, but today we're just gonna focus on trail braking. So far, we've just been looking at the front tires, ignoring the fact that the rear tires must also follow suit. In a perfectly balanced car, both the front tires and the rear tires will be exploiting all of their 1G of force all of the time. But this is never the case, cars are never perfectly balanced, and this is why we describe them as either front or rear limited, meaning that that axle breaks traction before the other. Anyway, that's more of a setup lesson, but it's very hard to not drift off into other topics, as they're all intrinsically linked. Drift off. Get it? Anyway, the reason why we brake into the corner is to increase the front axle's grip or load that it can cope with from say 1G to 1.5G, but this of course reduces the grip at the rear available. And this balancing act goes on and on and on and it's the battle that racing drivers are constantly having through every second of every corner. But this is the simplified fundamentals of it. Now we've done a bit of theory, let's look at a lap and you can see how I'm manipulating weight transfer and obeying the laws of a friction circle to my advantage. 
And to help explain, we have these traces of my inputs here, red for brake, green for throttle, white is steering, but also if you prefer, you can just see my feet and hands and how they're moving real time. Here we go for my lap that put me P2 in the top split in quali. Look at turn one, how I reach peak brake pressure very early, then I bleed off the brake to the apex, feed on the throttle, could have been smoother with the throttle, but got a good exit nonetheless. Feeding it through the crane of curves, no need to lift until we're hard on the brakes for old hairpin. Again, look at that trace, really slowly bleeding off the brake until we get to that apex. Trying to brake in as much of a straight line as possible with full brake pressure, then you can see as I introduced the steering, I eased off the brake. And again up here, it goes very light at the apex. And there's a little bit of a sharper jump off the brake here because like I say, it goes over a crest. You're getting on the power, all the grip levels change. That's a bit of an unusual corner. Now into the chicane, we're down into third and you can see I lift or hesitate slightly on the throttle in between the two chicanes in order to give weight to the front and let it tuck for the right. Really hard on the brakes and look at how long I drag the brake, carry it through, through that apex. I get to about 10% and then stay there for half a second or so. And again, final corner, look at how long I hold that brake for, really trying to load the front all the way through these long, long corners. So that was it, across the line and just a tenth of a second off pole. As you can see, there are a huge number of variables, but throughout all of these, the same principle applies. Now, before I go any further, if you have learned something from this video so far, please like and subscribe. It helps me out a lot to make more videos like this one. Also, you can check out the merch that I have just launched, like this spoiler alert range. Again, another great pun. And for up to 20% off all of my merch, go and check out my Patreon. You'll get other benefits as well. All the links in the description and at the end of the video, but for now, let's continue. What I'm going to do now is show you all the best bits, the overtakes, the battles, and how I'm using trail braking when I'm behind, when I'm in front, and when I'm making moves. Straight to the inside. Cold tyres are terrible. Immediately at turn one, we have the perfect example of trail braking, but not in the usual sense, because you can see actually I brake normally for the corner, I come all the way off the brakes to zero, and then I realize, hang on a sec, the front doesn't have enough grip, and then I go back onto the brakes and carry the brakes, probably how I should have done in the first place, but this shows how you can correct and adapt, and it's not a linear cut and dry process. Now we're going into McLean's and I'm under pressure, so I'm defending, I'm going tight, making the corner tighter, which means I carry the brake for even longer around the corner. And now we're just going up towards Coppice, which is this right-hander over the crest. And what's very interesting is when you watch my brake trace here is how it changes when the tires are hot in a couple of laps. As I mentioned during quali, I have a lift in between the left and the right, and that is in a way a form of trail braking. It's a weight transfer, it's more subtle because you're not actually braking, but you're just easing off the throttle, bit of weight on the nose in order to turn into the right. Now you see the two corners where trail braking is most extreme, which is Melbourne hairpin, this downhill right-hander, where there is such little grip at the apex it washes away from you, and the last corner, this left-hander, that again there's a little crest and the car pushes on a lot. And this is why the whole way round, nearly even past the main apex, you're still carrying the brake. Unless he's holding me up, I'd rather just sit here. Team's making all the mistakes. I'm just being really smooth. This is what I mentioned earlier, where you can see through both of these corners that I don't have to carry the brake quite as long. I can jump off the brake, or not jump off, ease off it slightly more promptly and get on the power earlier. This is just because the tyres are all up to temperature and I have a good understanding of where the car and the track is at. And now we get some exciting racing. He is a bit overzealous into McLean's, runs wide, 
I get the run, try to go up the inside, but he blocks me. Then I move to the outside and he slowly moves to cover me off. And then we're back in formation. That was a good bit of racing and defending by him. Although really, shouldn't have made the mistake. It's much easier. We're embarking on an incredibly exciting lap of racing, starting here at turn one. He again, feeling the pressure from the master that is me, runs wide, gets no traction. I managed to get up the inside this time, force myself there. My run is good enough that I'm in front before the left-hander, so he never has the inside line. He is, however, still close going into old hairpin, so I defend. The back marker confuses things a bit, but doesn't really hinder either of us. Here, I was definitely hindered. I didn't know if he was going to stick on his line and I got the inside, or if he was going to go to the inside like he did. Really, as a rule of thumb, he should have just stuck to the racing line, as you will see later on. I find myself going tight into McLean's defending again, and of course, being really aware that I need to hold the brake for longer, the corner is tighter than it normally is. Into coppice, he looks to the inside, but I don't really hesitate. I stick to my line because I know that he does not have enough pace. A move into the chicane is always a bold one and not one that I expected from him, hence why, just as at coppice, I didn't flinch when he looked to the inside. This time, however, he did commit, squeeze me a bit wide, I wasn't going to make it, so I thought, right, just commit to going over the gravel, it's the easiest, safest way. And then, immediately after, I ran wide, he runs wide, down into the hairpin, but not enough for me to have any sort of opportunity. The hairpin is the corner that has tripped both of us up the most time, so I'm really aware to really hold the brake, not run wide, not get sucked into it, although I did a couple of times, but this is where the trail braking really, really shows at this hairpin. I wanted to just commentate on my fastest lap for you and take you through why I think it is the fastest lap. So starting off with turn one, Really good traces, you can see on the brake and the throttle, really smooth, no jagged edges, nothing. Then through the craner curves, it's all about, again, just being as smooth as possible. I actually had a little lift through the left, just to settle the car nice and straight for the braking through old hairpin. Used a lot of curb and it didn't bounce too much. Again, those traces are buttery smooth. Braking in a straight line and I seem to turn in very early through McLean's, it really works for me and then braking really late up the hill. Again, a little bit of curb on the inside, but just at the right angle where it didn't bounce much. Managed to get on the throttle really early as well. As you can see, the delta is ticking down. Braking at the board on the left, using lots of track, feeding it left, right. Absolutely no slide on the exit of the chicane, pure power down. Maintained a really good brake pressure into the hairpin and again, super smooth trail braking, holding it past even the midway point and then really sharply on the throttle because you can it's point and squirt. Then last corner, the line was really good. Little bit over the curb on the inside, little wobble on the throttle on the exit. But if you look at my steering tray through the last corner, it's so smooth. That's my favorite bit to look at from that. Who'd have thought it? Once again, we're back at the hairpin and he is running wide. I focus on my trail braking, get it turned in, but not an opportunity, just not enough of a difference. And then here we are one lap later. He does the same thing, but I stuff it straight up the inside, manage to get alongside our drive, our exit out the corner is slightly compromised because I was tight. He's still up the inside for the left-hander, which is where he wants to be. I think maybe I'll get the undercut on the exit, but just don't quite put the power down. And we're back where we started. And again, one lap later, I get a absolutely mega exit from the chicane. He does not. I force him to the inside, which is where I want him because I know he struggles breaking into this corner. So I know if he's up the inside, he's almost certainly gonna run wide. Surprise, surprise, he does. He turns in and just clips my rear corner. Then on the run down to the final corner, the left-hander, all I'm doing is making sure he stays on my right the whole time. So I don't move out fully, don't give him the opportunity. All I want is him on the right-hand side. Again, he turns in. I've got the inside, he can turn in as much as he wants. I'm not going. He's gonna be the one to crash if there is an instant. And then we file through and I'm ahead. For now, that is. 
Same philosophy defending into turn one, I just want him on the outside, focusing on being really smooth, trail breaking in, and he is still behind, but he is so, so close, practically nudging me. We feed it through the Craner curves, I break slightly defending for old hairpin just towards the inside for the entry phase so he knows it's blocked off, he can't launch a move. I have to go around the outside for that left kink and defend tight into McLean's. This is where you can really see in those input traces me thinking about trail braking because I have a couple of goes at it as this isn't a corner that I've really got to before. A corner is completely different when you approach it off the rubber on the inside so I was having to feel it out as I'm going. You'll also notice a sneaky tactic here where I take quite a while to get back on the throttle. Now P3 is miles back so outright pace isn't really a factor in my decision making but I see that he's gone wide on entry and can easily undercut me in the run up to coppice as he was going to but what I do is I basically just stop the car on the apex. I block the part of track that he wants to use. It's not outright quickest, but it means that he can't undercut me as I run wide, so I just stop on the apex. He actually hits the back of me here, so I was hoping he'd have braked in time, but he didn't, and I likely got a little bit of damage from this. But the theory's there. And now we have my moment of shame where I break about two tenths of a second too late into the hairpin, run wide, he gets alongside, but I've carried a bit more speed and only lose a couple of tenths, but yeah, happens to the best of us. Who'd have thought it, I find myself defending at McLean's again, going in tight and not getting the best of exits, so I'm forced to defend up into coppice. I just make sure he's on the outside, he darts to the inside last minute, but what I actually do is I come off the brake a bit early at the apex, just to roll a bit further forward so I can cut in front and maintain the position. Now we have a devastating set of events coming up. This is why I say stick on your line. There we go, I'm closing down him so quickly. I think, well, I'm gonna compromise the left into the chicane in order to cut up the inside on the right. So I slow myself down, get all ready to do it. And then he decides he's gonna pull out of the way right onto the inside where I was gonna go. Very silly move, just stick to your line. This definitely gave me a lot of damage, that did not help. But luckily, look what happens at Melbourne Hairpin. Oh, who'd have thought? He runs wide, I take the position back. So didn't lose too much other than the damage really. You may see a pattern emerging because here I am again defending into McLean's, up the inside, really focusing on my trail braking, but here he tries to go all the way around the outside. He doesn't really have the space, but I move to defend Coppice, this right-hander, and then wash him wide on the exit. It was a very optimistic move on his half, but good bit of racing. Using the character information that I determined earlier on in the race, I realized he is bold enough to attack into the chicane, so we have a bit of a battle down the straight where I'm trying to squeeze him wide, he's trying to squeeze me to the inside, and then I end up defending the chicane. Now I know that the hairpin after the chicane is the main overtaking point, so I'm really conscious that I need to stay on the inside on the exit, which I manage to do, even though he gives me a little tap. I then defend the hairpin, run slightly wider on exit as you do naturally and he tries to undercut me but luckily I've got the inside for the upcoming left hander, the final turn. Here you can see again where I ease off the brake a bit too early and then go back on the brake just to tuck the front in for that second half, manipulating weight transfer and trail braking. Now we're at turn one again. I'm defending and here this is where he tries to undercut me and as I'm exiting and getting on the power he gives me a bit of a nudge that causes me to slide. Then he gets better traction, a better run and overtakes exactly as I did to him earlier on in the race. We get to the back marker who doesn't cause too much of a problem but I did make a bit of a mistake through the left, underestimated the wash. Now we're battling back up to McLean's, I look to the inside through the left kink, he cuts me straight off and I don't quite make it and then we're back in formation coming on to the last lap. Now the last turn of the last lap, I am not close enough to make a move but seeing as third place is miles back I just 
go to look up the inside, try and put him off a bit as I know he can be put off. So I think I'll look to the inside, break late, see if I can rattle him, but he keeps it together. And then we are P1 and I am P2. So what is the key to effective trail braking? In a word, smooth. Imagine you're actually driving around the edge of the friction circle, which is what you're doing the whole time. With fast, jagged, quick movements, you're not going to be able to do it. You're going to be in and out over the limit of traction the whole time. But the catch is, when you do go outside the friction circle, over the limit of traction, the fall off is fast, faster than linear, which means you're better off being 5% under the limit than 2% over it. So make sure you're keeping it smooth. If you've made it this far, you're clearly a racing god and all racing gods like and subscribe. But if you're a true racing goat, then you also check out my merch and Patreon. Go and do that now. Links all around. Thanks.